Good morning, everyone. My name is Gail Manchin, and I serve as chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF. Thank you for joining us for this event about USERF's two programs that shine a light on victims of religious persecution, the Freedom of Religion or Belief Victims List and our Religious Prisoners of Conscience Project. There are untold number of people imprisoned or otherwise targeted for their religion or belief around the world. These projects provide faces of the victims and tell their stories with the hope of improving their situation and drawing attention to religious freedom conditions around the globe. I would like to begin by providing an overview about our Freedom of Religion or Belief Victims List or Forbes Victims List. I, along with Vice Chair Tony Perkins, will review the Forbes Victims List and provide new insights into the data that we have cataloged to date, as well as provide a, an update about the Religious Prisoners of Conscience Project or R RPOC project. Following our presentation, you will hear from Representative Doug Lamborn of Colorado to share insights from working on the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission's Defending Freedom Project. Finally, I and several other USERF commissioners will highlight some of the religious prisoners of conscience we advocate on behalf of, with special appearances by family members and advocates of some of the RPOCs. USERF created the Four Victims List pursuant to the Frank R. Wolf International Religious Freedom Act. Specifically, the Frank Wolf Act mandated that you serve make publicly available to the extent practical, a list of persons it determines have been imprisoned, detained, disappeared, under house arrest, forced to renounce their faith or tortured due to their religion or belief by certain state or non-state perpetrators. Victims included in this list may have been targeted by one of these violations due to their faith-based activity or advocacy, or by laws that conflict with religious freedom, such as blasphemy or apostasy laws. In consideration of the safety and security of persons on the list, the Frank R. Wolf Act gives the commission leeway to exercise appropriate discretion when choosing whether to include a victim. Due to the sensitive nature of some of the cases, this discretion is incredibly important to ensure the safety of those included in our database and their families. Also, the legislative legislation requires us to look only at countries that we recommend for designation as a country of particular concern or CPC and entities for designation as entities of particular concern or EPCs. However, we expanded the list also include countries that we recommend for the State Department special watch list. Also, if a country or EPC is no longer included in our annual report, victims profile will remain in the database. After launching in October 2019, we are proud to say that the four victims list today contain entries over 1,000 victims of religious persecution. We would not have reached this achievement without the help of our partners in civil society who submitted cases for our consideration. On behalf of the commission, I say thank you to all of those who took the time to provide you, sir, with this very vital information. Due to the robust participation from our partners, the victims in the database represent a wide variety of faiths from around the world. One of our goals when developing the victims list was, and continues to be, highlighting the diversity of religious faith that ex that ex from experience that experience persecution. It is not just one or two groups that face detainment or imprisonment for their religion or belief. 
Our list contains over 20 unique religions, denominations, and belief systems. We take great pride in hosting a database that includes and values all believers and non-believers targeted for their religious activity or advocacy. It's now my pleasure to hand it over to my colleague, Vice Chair Tony Perkins, to give you a tour of our database. Thank you, Chair Manchin, and uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Now I'd like to give you a brief tour of the Forb Victims List. Uh, the live database can be accessed through Forb Victims List link on the USERF homepage or directly at userf.gov slash victims dash list. Now on the screen now, you can see a screenshot of an individual victim. This is Nywin Bach -Tru Truyan. Uh, whom fellow uh, Vice Chair Anarima Bargava has adopted as a part of USERF's Religious Prisoner of Conscience project. And the Vietnamese government targeted uh, Truyen uh, due to his human rights and religious freedom advocacy. And in 2017, he was sentenced to an 11 year prison term. Now on the main section of the page, you can see that we have information related to his case, such as the current status, and the most recent type of abuse that's been reported. Below this information, there is a section for extra biographical information that provides space to include the story of this victim and any miscellaneous details that do not fit into the other fields. Now, the other personal information and abuse details tabs contains other useful information about the victim uh, and the abuse that uh, occurred. Now, I would also like to highlight that there are links to share each victim's profile. This is important because this can be shared via email, Facebook, and Twitter, and that's at the right top corner. Now, what is important about this is that this gives us the uh, opportunity to provide uh, multiplication, and we invite you to use this feature to raise awareness for four victims uh, on social media and throughout your networks. Now, when sharing victims' profiles, we invite you to use the database hashtag, hashtag Forb Victims. Uh, we hope that this database and related advocacy can help spur a, really a global advocacy campaign on behalf of those persecuted due to their religious beliefs. Now, the database also includes uh, a charts page with uh, several donut graphs. Uh, this tool allows users to visualize and compare data within the database using eight convenient filters. Now, in looking at these charts, I should note that the database is not a comprehensive list of all victims. Now, with the development of the database, we strive to provide uh, credible, comprehensive, and current information. However, for reasons including, obviously, our limited resources and the difficulty in gathering and verifying information, it can be challenging to obtain and confirm complete information about every victim targeted for their beliefs. As such, while we're working diligently to create a comprehensive uh, list, one as, uh, as, as uh, comprehensive as possible, the, the cases within the database should not be viewed as an exhaustive list of, of victims. Um, or a reflection of global trends. So it's a, it's, it's a tool, but it's not comprehensive. What you have seen and heard today is just the beginning. We regularly are collecting new submissions. Uh, as I mentioned, the success of the victims list is overwhelmingly due to input we've received from individuals and as Chair Manchin mentioned, NGO allies in civil society. Now to build on that success, we again invite you to use a lot, utilize the victims intake form to submit information. Uh, this is how we get the information. We want this to be a tool for all of our allies in this area of religious, international religious freedom. And so you can submit that about the victims that you believe should be included in the database. A link to this intake form is on the footer of each page of the database titled Submit Victim Information. Now, if you have a larger number of submissions, you can utilize a special spreadsheet, the link and directions for which is at the uh, bottom of the victim's intake form. Now, I would like to briefly explain USERF's other major program, the Religious Prisoners of Conscience Project. Now, the RPOC project highlights individuals in prisons for exercising their freedom of belief, as well as the dedicated advocacy of commissioners working for those individuals release. Now, what distinguishes this project from the Forbes victim list is that commissioners 
adopt a prison and then commit to advocating for that individual's release from detainment. Now, once an ROPC has been adopted, there are a range of ways that a commissioner can draw attention to the plight of the prisoner to advocate for their release. Now, there are opportunities for advocacy, uh, which include highlighting key dates, such as the key, uh, the date of arrest, detainment, how long they've been held in, the how long they've been held in the anniversary dates. And of course, case developments on social that we can list on social media, meeting with family members and associates on uh, delegation trips, mentioning their adoptee during public events, publishing op-eds about their plight, and discussing uh, the individual in private meetings or correspondence with officials from the country in which the individual is being imprisoned. Now, we're proud to say that 14 prisoners adopted into the project have been released since we started the program in 2017. Most recently, Pastor Adal from Vietnam and uh, also uh, Hamid bin Haydara and Muhammad Ali Taheri from Iran. Now on the screen, you can see the current RPOCs adopted by USERF <clears throat> commissioners. I chose to adopt Leah Sherabu, a Nigerian Christian a teenager abducted by Boko Haram in 2018. Uh, she refuses to convert to Islam, and so she is still being held captive, and I will continue to advocate for her as long as she is held unjustly in captivity. Uh, Chair Manchin adopted Dennis Christensen, a Jehovah's Witness imprisoned in Russia, Golrok E. Rai, a human rights activist and author imprisoned in Iran. In addition, uh, since Vice Chair Anarima Bargava is unable to be here today, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge her, a religious prisoner of conscience. As I mentioned earlier, she adopted Nguyen Bak Truyen, uh, uh, Truyen from uh, Vietnam and also uh, Golmi Ra Imin, uh, Min, uh, a Uyghur Muslim imprisoned in China. Now, it is uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, Congressman Doug Lamborn to offer remarks on his prisoner of conscience advocacy. Uh, Congressman, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, I'm Congressman Doug Lamborn representing the 5th Congressional District of Colorado. It is an honor to speak to you today. I'm here to give an update on the unjust imprisonment of Pastor Yusuf Nader Khani in Iran. In 2017, Pastor Yusuf, a converted Christian from Islam, was tried on false charges of, quote, acting against national security and promoting, quote, Zionist Christianity. He was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. In July 2018, government agents raided Pastor Yusuf's home to execute the sentence by beating and apprehending him. The agents even used a taser gun on one of his sons. He is currently incarcerated at the notorious Evan Prison, the torture factory near Tehran. This past summer, the Iranian government reduced Yosef's sentence to six years. As of January 2021, we know that Pastor Yusuf's oldest son, Daniel, is working in a market to support the family. However, he is being threatened with military conscription. Their younger son, Joel's education, has been forced to stop due to the authorities refusing to allow him to register for online learning during the COVID pandemic. Sadly, both of Pastor Yusuf's sons were harassed by the authorities after the young men decided to opt out of Islamic classes due to their Christian faith. The Iranian government must be held accountable for their abhorrent treatment of Pastor Yusuf. The Iranian constitution recognizes religious minorities, including some Christian denominations, and permits them to worship and form religious societies, quote, within the limits of the law, unquote. They also have the freedom to address personal affairs and religious education according to their own religious canon. Pastor Yusuf should be able to resume leadership of his 400 member church free from the threat of religious persecution. In light of their interest in renegotiating the nuclear agreement with the United States, Iran clearly wants to be taken seriously on the world stage. However, the continued unjustified detainment of prisoners like Pastor Yusuf increasingly jeopardizes Iran's already unstable position. The Department of State must continue calling for his release, and I hope the Iranian government will take these calls seriously. Until then, we pray for the health of Pastor Yusuf and call for his immediate release. 
Thank you again to you, Surf, for the great work you are doing and for the opportunity to speak with you today. Vice Chair Perkins, distinguished guest and fellow panelists. My name is Jim Carr, and I'd like to take this time to talk about the RPOCs that I adopted since joining USURF a year ago. The first is Deacon Zhang Wen Shi, also known by his Korean name as Shin Moon Sok. North Korea consistently ranks among the most repressive regimes in the world, in part because of its deplorable human rights record. There's no freedom of religion and belief in the country, and they are especially tough on Christians. The deacon is a Chinese uh, citizen of Korean descent from the border region between North Korea and China. North Koreans often come to the border towns in China to conduct business, and Deacon Zhang regularly hosts them. And he shared his Christian faith with many of those North Koreans and provided them instruction from the Bible. Largely because of this activity, the North Korean government kidnapped him and took him into North Korea in November of 2014. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison for his missionary work, even though he's a Chinese citizen. I'm amazed that the Chinese government tolerates this. I advocate for his immediate release. Let me shift my focus now to Malaysia, a country you surf recommends for special watch list. And my RPOC there is Pastor Raymond Cole. Malaysia is a functioning democracy in a region filled with author authoritarianism. The World Trade Organization predicts Malaysia will transition to a high income economy by 2024, which would make it second in the region only to Singapore. Nevertheless, it has a persistent poor record, and in some ways a deteriorating record in upholding freedom of religion and belief. Ethnic religious Malay Islamic nationalism continues to dominate political and social discourse. Islamic law is officially and strictly regulated and non-Muslim communities are forbidden from proselytizing to Muslims. These among other ongoing and systematic victims of religious Freedom are reasons why Malaysia has been featured in USERF's annual report since the year 2014. Pastor Raymond Ko is a Christian Malaysian and Christian leader who, in addition to raising a family and leading his faith community, was an activist and advocate for those disadvantaged in society, regardless of their faith. For this, he was targeted by the authorities. On February 13, 2017, Pastor Raymond Co. was abducted by security forces in broad daylight. <clears throat> On a highway outside of Kuala Lumpur, three black vans surrounded Pastor Co.'s car in a scene captured on CCTV. In October 2019, USERF published a fact sheet detailing the findings and religious freedom uh, implications. In that report, we alerted the US government to the religious freedom dimension of the disappearance of both Amari Se and Pastor Ko. These individuals were undeniably targeted in part for their religious practice and identity. In November of 2020, I adopted Pastor Ko through the RPOC project. His disappearance at the hands of security forces as well as the disappearance of others represented an ominous and terrifying turn for Malaysia. Now I'd like for you to hear a recorded message from Pastor Ko's wife, who I had the pleasure of uh, an extended Zoom call with not too long ago, Susanna Ko. She's an incredible lady who has been a tireless advocate for her husband and all those disappeared by forces associated with the government. Good morning. My name is Susanna Ko, and I am the wife of Pastor Raymond Ko, who was adopted in February 2017. I want to thank Commissioner James Carr for adopting Pastor Raymond as a prisoner of conscience. 
Pastor Raymond is an ordained minister of the Evangelical Free Church of Malaysia. He pastored a church for 15 years. In 2004, he retired and started a non-profit called Hope Community. Hope Community works amongst the poor, the needy and the marginalized. He started shelter homes for HIV AIDS, a reading room for students and also help single mothers and refugees in providing training for them such as baking, cooking and jewelry making. Pastor Raymond is a simple and kind man. He has a passion for the loss, especially the unriched peoples of Malaysia. He loves to tell Bible stories to whoever that is willing to listen, irrespective of race and religion. And I suspect that because of his social work, he has been uh, suspected of uh, proselyting Muslims to Christianity. On February 13, 2017, Pastor Raymond was suddenly and violently adopted by 15 men, seven vehicles, in what looked like a very well executed military style operation lasting only 40 seconds. We lodged a complaint to the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia and they held a public inquiry lasting more than a year. Their conclusion was that Pastor Raymond was a victim of enforced disappearance and that state agents, namely the Malaysian police, were involved. We have tried to appeal to the former Prime Minister Tun Dr Mahathir and personally met him to resolve this case. We have also met the current Prime Minister Tan Sri Muhyiddin and he promised to get to the bottom of this. However, we have not seen any result. Neither did we get any update or news from the police. Therefore, the family last year filed a civil suit against the police and the government. And now we are appealing to the international community to help us pressure the government to resolve these cases of enforced disappearance. My prayer is that Pastor Raymond, Amri Chetmat, a Shia Muslim, Pastor Joshua Helmi and Ruth Sitipu who were similarly disappeared, will be released as they did not do anything that deserves death or jail. Their personal liberties have been violated. As enshrined in our federal constitution, there is a right to believe, right to movement, and right to counsel. I hope that you, we can get help to advocate for this case 
and that justice and truth will prevail. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Commissioner Carr, for that report and, and that powerful message uh, from uh, the wife of Pastor Raymond Coe. Hello, everyone. My name is Fred Davey, and I would like to take this time to talk about Nigeria, a country USERF recommends for a country of particular concern, CPC designation, and to talk about two RPOCs, religious, religious prisoners of conscience, uh, in Nigeria, whom I adopted. Nigeria is a federalized democracy and the most populous country in Africa. In addition to threats from non-state actors, Nigerians also face threats to their religious freedom from the government itself. 12 of Nigeria's 36 states have enacted Sharia codes to manage civil and family matters for Muslim citizens. The courts have passed harsh sentences for blasphemers, including the death penalty. For example, last year, a Sharia court in Kano State sentenced 22-year-old Yahya Sharif Aminu to death for insulting the Prophet Muhammad in a private social media message. Mr. Yahya is a Muslim gospel singer and follower of the Tinjuniya order, a prominent Sufi Muslim minority group in Nigeria. Kano authorities tried him in secret and have restricted his access to his legal team. These irregularities led a higher court to order Mr. Yahaya's case be retried, though we are still waiting to learn the results of the second trial. Kano state authorities are also responsible for the arbitrary arrest and detention of prominent humanist activist Mubarak Bala. In 2015, Mr. Bala revealed his atheist beliefs to his family and was subsequently committed to an, an insane asylum against his will, where he was drugged in hell for three days. He became a passionate advocate for human rights and tolerance for atheist beliefs in Nigeria's highly religious society. In April 2020, Mr. Bala was arrested and transferred to Kano State custody following a petition by Kano lawyers that, pro that authorities prosecute Mr. Bala for posting things on Facebook that are, quote, provocative and annoying to Muslims, end quote. Authorities have restricted his access to his lawyers and at times refused to acknowledge his whereabouts or confirm his well-being, even to his wife. Eventually, in December, a federal court ruled his detention illegal and demanded his release. Still Kano, State, still, Kano State authorities have not released Mr. Bala, and he remains detained without charge. I turn now to my friend and fellow commissioner, Commissioner Nadine Mensa, to tell you about the RPOCs she adopted. Thanks so much, Commissioner Davey. Good afternoon, my name is Nadine Mayenza, and one of my adopted prisoners of conscience is Pastor Youssef Natakani. And as you just heard from Congressman Doug Lamborn, Pastor Natakani is the leader of the Evangelical Church of Iran and ministers to a 400 member church there. Iran restricts freedom of religion or belief for Christians, and in particular, Muslims who convert to Christianity. In 2010, a court sentenced him to death for apostasy, but thanks to international efforts, the sentence was lifted in 2012. In 2016, he was charged again by Iran's government. This time he was accused of, quote, promoting Zionist Christianity and acting against national security for his pastoral work. Yusuf is greatly concerned that Pastor Natakani may contract COVID-19 while in prison, given the unsanitary conditions in Iranian prisons and the widespread outbreak of the virus in Iran. We call for his immediate release. My second religious prisoner of conscience I'd like to highlight is Gidhun Choki Naima, the 11th Panchen Lama. The Panchen Lama occupies the second highest position in Tibetan Buddhism and is a spiritual leader of the Tibetan people after the Dalai Lama, he, who chose Naima as the 11th Panchen Lama in 1995. That same year, Chinese authorities kidnapped the, six, the then six-year-old Panchen Lama and announced their own pick, which constituted a gross violation of the Tibetan people's religious freedom. No one has seen or heard from him since his abduction in 1995. 
the Chinese authorities have been uncooperative and unwilling to demonstrate any proof of life, apart from a statement that, quote, he does not wish to be disturbed, unquote. Nonetheless, we will continue to advocate for his case and call on the China government of China to demonstrate some proof of life, as well as to let international observers meet with him. Lastly, I will speak about one of my first religious prisoner of conscience I adopted after being appointed to USERF, Raif Badawi. He is the founder of the Free Saudi Liberal Blog, where he began posting in 2008. Ms. Mr. Badawi and his colleagues intended the website to encourage civil discussion of political and social issues in Saudi Arabia. In fact, I've read this book of many of his blog posts, and it's called 1,000 Lashes Because I Say What I Think, and they are insightful, they are funny, and none are worthy of punishment. Badawi faced harassment following the creation of this blog, beginning with charges of insulting Islam in 2008, continuing through 2009 with a travel ban and then an asset freeze. And then in June of 2012, he was arrested in December of 2012, um, put on trial for charges of insulting Islam. He was sentenced in May of 2014 to 10 years in prison, 1,000 lashes and 1 million rial fine and a 10 year travel ban and media ban following his release. Mr. Badawi received the first 50 lashes publicly in January 2015 outside of a mosque in Jeddah, Following an international outcry and a doctor's um, finding that Badawi could not physically endure any more lashings, no further lashings have yet been carried out. In September 2019, Mr. Badawi began a hunger strike after some of his medicines were taken away. Following a visit from the Saudi Human Rights Commission, he ended the hunger strike. However, in late 2019, the prison moved him into solitary confinement for, for no known reason. Cut off from the world, Mr. Badawi began a second hunger strike, which lasted through the end of 2019 and led to his hospitalization. And just days ago, we heard his medications were being withheld yet once again. In early 2020, the Saudi government denied Mr. Badawi any contact with his wife, Insef, or their three children, who were granted asylum in the government of Canada in 2013 and became citizens there in 2018. It was not until May of that year that Insep finally had the opportunity to speak to her husband. On that call, he revealed that he had been returned from solitary confinement to a joint prison cell with other inmates, including a religious extremist who reportedly tried to assassinate him. Yusuf remains greatly concerned for his safety, particularly amid the COVID global pandemic. We urge Congress and the administration to continue to urge Saudi Arabia to release Raif Badawi so he can rejoin his family after years of separation. I am proud to introduce Raif's wife, the brave and dear Insef Hader, who is president of the Raif Badawi Foundation for Freedom, and she recorded a video just for this occasion. Mesdames et Messieurs, merci de me permettre de vous parler cette réunion de la Commission des États-Unis sur les libertés religieuses internationales. Je suis un mère de famille qui, depuis 9 ans, Élève seul, mes trois enfants n'ont joie de 10 millions. Je ne suis pas veuve, je ne suis pas divorcée. Mon mari ne nous a pas abandonné. Depuis 9 ans, mon mari est enfermé dans une prison de l'Arabie Saoudite. Mon mari est un prisonnier du Bénin. Raif est un blogueur qui a fondé en 2008 un site web. Il est demandé pour les Saoudiens le droit de choisir leur religion, les libertés d'expression et l'égalité entre hommes et femmes. C'est pour cette raison que mon mari a été arrêté en 2012, accusé d'avoir critiqué l'islam dans le web. Il était condamné à recevoir mille coups de fouet, dix ans en prison, et après sa libération, n'est pas sorti de l'Arabie Saoudite pendant un quart des ans. Mille coups de fouet pour des phrases pacifiques, c'est injuste. Ma famille est brisée. Nous avons déjà perdu nos ans de notre vie familiale. Nos vins qui ne reviendront jamais. Raïf qui adore nos enfants, ne le voit pas grandir. N'est pas pu les aider à faire leur devoir. Depuis 9 ans, il n'a pas joué avec, ni fêté leur anniversaire. Mes enfants, ils s'ennuient de lui. Et moi, il m'a manqué cruellement. On a des amis, de la famille, mais avec notre papa, ce serait 100 fois mieux. 
Et si la peine était appliquée entièrement, Raif, nous pourrons nous embrasser quand 2032, à l'heure que nos enfants seront adultes. Nous avions espoir qu'ils reviendraient plus tôt. Raif n'est pas un criminel. Elle est en prison pour avoir fait pacifiquement les promotions des déclarations universelles des droits humains en Arabie Saoudite. Ça, ce n'est pas un délit. Je m'adresse à vous qui être père et mère. Je m'adresse au président Joe Biden et à la vice-présidente Kamala Harris. Aidez-nous à pouvoir vivre avec le père et l'époux qui nous manquent. Aidez-nous à vivre en famille. Chaque mois, chaque semaine, chaque jour, chaque minute qu'on gagne pour sa liberté, c'était une victoire pour la liberté de tous. Merci de défendre nos cœurs. Hello, my name is Nuri Turkel. I am today announcing my adoption of religious prisoners of conscience, Shamil Haki of, uh, Hakima from Tajikistan. Year after year, Tajikistan remains one of the world's worst violators of religious freedom. The government heavily controls and restricts Islam, the dominant religion in the country, including appointing imams and paying their salaries while dictating the content of many sermons. Religious minorities like Je Jehovah's Witnesses are targeted as extremists or for inciting religious hatred and conscientious objection to the military service. Under the dubious claims of combating extremism, Tajikistan has continued to crack down on individuals throughout religion, uh, through religion, media, and civil society. Tajikistani prisoners are decrypt uh, and overcrowded uh, and cram violent criminals and terrorists together with those persecuted under trumped up extremism charges. Torches endemic and religious prisoners face increased pressure from both guards and other inmates. Shamil Hakiyof, Hakimov is one of those belligerent religious prisoners. In February 2019, Tajik authorities arrested the 70-year-old man and charged him with inciting religious hatred. Police had previously found his phone number with Jehovah's Witnesses, Witness who, had, who they had arrested for sharing their face subsequently accusing him of being the local Jehovah's Witness leader. Hakimov was also investigated for processing, possessing a Tajik language Bible, which the authorities deemed as inciting hatred, along with Jehovah's Witnesses uh, uh, literature considered extremist. The court placed him in the pretrial detention for over six months after charging him and in September 2019, he was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison. The court also imposed three year ban on his religious activity after he completes his sentence. He lost an appeal in October 2019 and will remain in prison until he is 74 years old and unable to practice his face until he is 78. Hakimov suffers from high blood pressure and is in general bad health. At the time of his arrest, he was still recovering from major surgery. As an elderly man, he faces increased risk of exposure to COVID-19 in prison. His exact conditions are unknown, but he has been reportedly been forbidden from reading his Bible in prison. Recently, Tajikistan has expressed, in, expressed an interest in reforming its approach to religious regulations and consultation with international community. It should start by releasing Shamil Hakimov and all other imprisoned in Tajikistan for their peaceful religious activity. Before concluding, I, will, I would also like to note that while neighboring Uzbekistan has taken unprecedented steps to improve conditions for religious freedom in the last few years, including by working with USERF and other international partners to reform its religion law and release some of the prisoners, some persistent problems remain. We are particularly concerned about the condition of religious prisoners, prisoner Hayrullah Tursunov, whose health have been recently deteriorated significantly. We likewise urge Uzbekistan to per, uh, provide him urgent medical care and release him 
and all other religious prisoners. Next up, next up is my colleague, uh, Commissioner Gary Bauer. Thank you, Commissioner Turkle. My name is Gary Bauer, and I'd like to take my time to talk about the RPOC who I've adopted, Hu Gang in Communist China. Hu Gang is a Christian house church elder and a democracy activist. He is yet another Chinese national in a long and growing list of Christians and human rights activists whom communist China has imprisoned simply because of their religious identity and practices. In July, 2015, Chinese authorities disappeared Hu Shengang as part of what was a larger crackdown on human rights lawyers and activists, many of whom were Christians, including Christian lawyers who had defended the religious freedom of Christians, as well as Falun Gong practitioners in court. Now, this wasn't his first run in with the government. He was previously imprisoned for 16 long years from 1992 to 2008 because he advocated for democracy and labor rights. And of course, during that time, he was repeatedly beaten and tortured while in custody. Then in 2016, he ran into trouble again. A Chinese communist court convicted him of subverting state power because of his religious activities and they sentenced him to seven and a half years in prison. Unbelievable. Authorities noted at whose religious activities and his support for Western ideas were part of the reason for this heavy, heavy sentence. Who was not seen again until November of 2016 when his family could visit him for the first time over a year after his initial disappearance. Of course, his health had deteriorated while in prison, but the authorities have heartlessly denied his request for medical parole. Hu Shengang's unjust treatment as a criminal for simply pursuing his faith according to his conscience and for standing up for human rights is further evidence of the turn toward greater repression that communist China has taken under Xi Jinping. No faith is safe in communist China. The government's declared war on all religions. I will continue to advocate for Hu Shengang's release and for the release of all those facing similar circumstances in China and for liberty, including religious liberty, to come to the Chinese people. Thank you for listening to his story. Now you'll hear from Commissioner Johnny Moore. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bauer, and hello to all of those uh, watching. Uh, my name is Johnny Moore. Uh, like my colleagues before me, I'll be speaking about the religious prisoners of conscience that I have adopted. And the first is a patriarch, a patriarch Abune Antonios. Patriarch Antonios was the rightful patriarch of the Eritrean Orthodox Church. On January 20th, 2006, Eritrean authorities removed the patriarch from his post and placed him under house arrest. One year later, the authorities confiscated his personal pontifical insignia and illegally replaced him. In 2007, the Eritrean authorities forcefully removed the patriarch and detained him at an undisclosed location. The patriarch continues to be held under poor conditions and denied medical care despite suffering from severe diabetes. Uh, his uh, con condition was mentioned by the Vice President of the United States in the previous administration uh, during the inaugural uh, Ministerial on, on International Religious Freedom, yet he still remains detained and he must be released immediately. The second religious prisoner of conscience who I have adopted uh, and most recently is Jimmy Lai. Jimmy is a religious freedom advocate a democracy activist and an entrepreneur in Hong Kong. Mr. Lai escaped communist China to Hong Kong at the age of 12. He was alone and penniless and he eventually became a self-made billionaire 
through sheer hard work, through the opportunity that Hong Kong uh, provided him. His life and his story demonstrate that uh, a free Hong Kong can bring uh, this type of success. And yet Hong Kong, once the only place in China that still enjoyed some degree of freedom, is becoming increasingly more uh, repressive under the Communist Party's rule. But that grim reality has not stopped Jimmy Lai and his fellow democracy activists. Uh, others like Joshua Wang and Agnes, uh, Agnes Chow, they've risked their own liberty and lives. And Jimmy Lai and other activists peacefully stood up to the Hong Kong and Chinese governments. They demanded that the authorities not strip away the freedoms long promised to the Hong Kong people. The very promises that the government of China itself agreed to and signed onto as part of its international treaty to assume authority over Hong Kong from Great Britain in 1997. What many may not realize is that faith has animated the activism of Mr. Lai. Jimmy Lai is a devout Roman Catholic who has tirelessly advocated for the religious freedom of Catholic churches and believers in mainland China. He also openly expressed concerns over the future of religious freedom in Hong Kong specifically. In August 2020, the Hong Kong authorities arrested Jimmy Lai for alleged collusion with foreign forces under the infamous new national security law, which the central Chinese communist government had arbitrarily imposed on Hong Kong. In December, Hong Kong authorities charged Lai with colluding with foreign forces, making him the first high profile figure to face charges under the new law. The Hong Kong and Chinese governments must guarantee Jimmy Lai due process and allow him to post bail as requested. But let's be absolutely clear. Jimmy Lai is being arbitrarily detained and he should not have been charged in the first place. Lai is an outstanding citizen and a democracy advocate who deserves praise for his work, not imprisonment. And Jimmy Lai isn't the only one either. Uh, just last week, authorities charged the 83-year-old Martin Lee, a renowned figure who helped write Hong Kong's basic law in 1980. The Washington Post reported, quote, if they will arrest Martin Lee, they will arrest anyone. Unfortunately, the United States consulate in a statement in the Wall Street Journal this morning uh, regarding the, the sale of our uh, consulate facility there uh, said, quote, we value and remain committed to the strong and vibrant relationship between the United States and Hong Kong. Yet that strong and vibrant relationship is being tested as ever before as a vibrant and free Hong Kong is now increasingly just another limb of the worst vices of the Communist Party of China. And we have to stand up to it. And before I invite uh, Chair Manchin to provide some concluding remarks, I'd like to make uh, two brief observations. The first uh, is I, I would like to take one more opportunity to express my gratitude uh, for our tremendous colleagues, beginning with the brilliant research and management staff at USERF and also my fellow commissioners. Uh, this commission continues to demonstrate that bipartisanship is possible in Washington, D.C., when sincere people are willing to act in good faith and the difference that can be made when unity isn't defined as uniformity. Many persecuted individuals are free and safe because of this commission's efforts, and more will be freed and safe. Countries are improving and others are not allowed any longer to perpetuate their injustices in the dark corners of the world without the bright light of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom shining in those dark places. And then finally, I wanna reiterate that USERF is an independent watchdog of U US foreign policy, whose work is conducted by consensus, whoever is in office. The legislation that created USERF also offers its commissioners the opportunity to express individual points of view. And the Religious Prisoners of Conscious project reflects some of those individual choices to adopt prisoners. And I'd like to conclude with expressing an individual point of view on one issue uh, that I am sure is shared by many of my colleagues, if not all of them. As I was listening to uh, everyone this morning, I simply cannot help but think about what's happening today uh, with regard to the Islamic Republic of Iran. 
the Islamic Republic remains one of the world's foremost violators of religious freedom and human rights. It is a CPC on our list. But it just mowed down protesters with live rounds this week alone and also killed a Sufi activist by denying him medical care, which Yusuf issued a statement about yesterday. Iran is widely said to be the world's leading sponsor of terror. Its affiliation with certain Shia militias was evident in recent days via attacks in Iraq, one which killed a US contractor last week, rockets which likely had to do with a militia which targeted the US embassy just a few days ago. But what I don't hear so often, which I think is relevant to uh, our, our event this morning, is that Iran is also the world's leading proprietor of hostage diplomacy. And yesterday, one previous American hostage who was freed in 2019 uh, wrote in the Wall Street Journal a powerful editorial. His name is Wang Xiyu. Wang was kidnapped after a US citizen, a PhD student studying in Iran. He was kidna kidnapped after the implementation of the JCPOA. He is a prisoner that I personally advocated for in my private capacity. And yesterday he warned in the Wall Street Journal for 42 years, Iran has demonstrated that it changes its behavior only in response to strength in the form of American led international pressure. If the present administration returns to the JCPOA without extracting concessions from Iran, beyond the nuclear threat, it will relinquish all US leverage over the regime. Diplomacy can't succeed without leverage. Only by showing strength of will can one hope for genuine progress in containing the Iranian threat to peace." End quote. There simply can be no negotiations with Iran. This is my personal point of view. And I think a point of view shared by many of my colleagues, which do not deal with incarcerated Americans, Iran's human rights and religious freedom abuses, and its destabilizing activity in many countries of the world, like Yemen and, and Iraq. And at the heart of that destabilizing activity is the targeting of religious minorities and the exploitation of hostages, often religious prisoners of conscience, activities that have persisted and will persist if the world doesn't say no. And with that, after an impassioned, impassioned appeal by all of my colleagues for people whom they have gotten to know by their advocacy, I will uh, turn uh, the microphone over to our distinguished chair, uh, Gail Manchin. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Commissioner uh, Johnny. <laughs> uh, I can't, Johnny Moore, I, um, I'm touched by your remarks, but also touched by the remarks of, of all of our commissioners. I think that while we're coming to the end of the program today, we certainly have illustrated our commitment, our passion, our dedication to uh, this one very special part of, of our work. And that is our work around our politi religious political uh, prisoners of conscience. And not only to uh, the commissioners for their comments uh, about these prisoners, but certainly the importance of the family members and advocates who also were contributed videos today. Many times I'm sure uh, almost being fearful for their safety in speaking out and yet their passion for their family and their family members that are being so unjustly imprisoned. But more importantly, I think, thank you to everyone that joined us today for this most special uh, event, highlighting our religious prisoners of conscience and also our religious prisoner of conscience database and the importance that that places, not only to, uh, to allow groups, other global groups around the world to be aware of what's happening, the face and name that we put on these victims, but also for the world to know what is happening in many of these countries where freedom of religion and belief or non-belief 
is not respected, not valued. People are not tolerated in their countries for expressing their faith. And I give a special thank you to the commissioners and also uh, as you did Johnny to the very professional staff at the US Commission on International Religious Freedom for the work that they do in showcasing, highlighting and bringing to everyone's attention what is happening around our world. Certainly though, to our people watching today and joining us, without your support, uh, the friends in government and civil society, the four victims list and the RPOC project would not be nearly as successful as they are today. It is our hope that those two programs will continue to be useful tools for supporting the release of those enduring repression for their religious convictions and advocacy. As mentioned earlier, we welcome submissions to the four victims list on a rolling basis. So please uh, not only come on to see and get information, but please to add information uh, to our list. And also feel free to share the victims profiles and the RPOC cases on your social media. We appreciate uh, everyone joining us today. Again, a very deep appreciation to our commission, commissioners for uh, adopting these religious prisoners of conscience, for bringing their stories forward, for advocating for them in such a meaningful, meaningful way. Again, to all of you out there, thank you. And please uh, continue to join USERP on its hearings and briefings as we come forth with this important information. Thank you all for joining us. And until our next meeting, goodbye and thank you.